Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at least, on my review of Portent by James Herbert. So, um, this is like an ecological slash climate changey thriller, um, and it's kind of a good time for me to be reading it, really, because we've just had the COP. 28 or whatever it was called the big um, climate change summit recently um, and just climate change has been on my mind I've been doing some stuff about that for some clients as well so I'm gonna read you the blurb then I'm gonna go through it and check out some of my tabs and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end I will say it's quite a forward-thinking book I mean it was first published in 1992 and I think we're only now really starting to see a lot of what he talks about coming to fruition you know Dane reads Something incredible is about to happen. Around the world from San Francisco to the Indian city of Varanasi, from the Great Barrier Reef to the Taklimakan Desert, forces of unimaginable violence are being unleashed. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, deadly hailstorms. Each disaster preceded by the mysterious appearance of strange, dazzling lights. Portents. Signs of a coming titanic struggle between the forces of darkness and light. A struggle involving a hermit in the remote Scottish Highlands with an extraordinary secret. Two very special children who unknowingly hold the future of the planet in their hands. And the grotesque matriarch of a bizarre New Orleans cult who is determined to destroy them. So, right at the beginning here uh, we have a little press cutting. Now it's from the Daily Mail, which is known for printing a load of rubbish. But it's about a mystery suicide of 7,000 penguins. Thousands of penguins have stampeded to their deaths on an island over which the ozone layer has been seriously damaged. Experts are baffled by the mass suicide of 7,000 king penguins on the uninhabited subantarctic Macari Island. So presumably that is a real clipping. It does have a date, so you could look it up. Monday, June 25th, 1990. We get this line about one guy who's gone dive diving. It said, Schneider had been reassured later that humans honestly weren't the shark's favourite food, no matter what certain movies insisted. Well, I think we all know what movie has been referred to there. And then this same character set, uh, thinks to himself that he'll turn into a purse-carrying puffter if he goes on like that, which is very homophobic. And then we get a nice little bit of gore and viscera, which James Herbert's very good at doing, so... Um, as his own body was buffeted by the sudden surge, he witnessed the most horrific thing in what was to be his comparatively short life. With a boom that might have come from a hundred cannon, fragments of living polyps shot towards the surface like blasted shrapnel, tearing through the other diver's body as though it were no more than papier-mâché. Barry, or the main part of Barry, disappeared in a great swirl of red while other pieces of him flew upwards with harder fragments to explode into the sunshine above in a furious fountain of blood, coral and flesh. Mm. Then we get introduced to one of our main characters, uh, he's in like a um, helicopter crash, but it says um, Rivers his throat, to use an expression Gardenia himself might use, felt as dry as a mummy's jockstrap. Alright, then we see another character who is having sex with a tree, if I've read this right. <laughs> so here was her third relationship, her third lover, spread all around her. The rocky hills, the timberlands, the streams and lakes, the snow-capped mountains beyond. And it was her lover in the true sense, for on more than one moonlit or moonless night, it made no difference. She had bathed in the chill waters, lain naked and damp on the forest's yielding carpet. She had taken a random tree as her mate, reaching her arms around the coarse trunk, raising her legs so that the roughness was against her thighs, the protrusions between her legs, holding herself there, thrusting against the hard, still tree, crying out to the night sky, both in ecstasy and in sorrow, finally sinking to the earth to lie there and whimper for her lost lover. We get a little reference to the butterfly effect. It says, the flutter of a butterfly's wings in Massachusetts might cause a tornado in India. Who would even know that the butterfly had taken wing? Just talking about how difficult it is to, um, you know, predict weather, basically. And then Rivers goes off to uh, meet those guys we heard about that are in, uh, up in Scotland, and one of them makes the joke, I had no idea climatologists brought their own weather with them which did make me chuckle. And this refers them back to that little snippet from the beginning. He came upon a relatively small item concerning the mass suicide of thousands of penguins at the beginning of the decade. A report next to this dealt with the relocation of endangered species such as the elephant, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, giraffe, to new game parks in the more favourable climes of Spain, Italy, southern France and North America. We get a reference to a research ship, uh, the Royal Research Ship Arthur C. Clarke. It's just a nice little name drop. Arthur C. Clarke, obviously, uh, very well known and very well respected science fiction author. Um, and then we find out this guy in Scotland, he has a theory that the Earth is like an organism of itself. 
and it uh, actually is actively trying to protect human beings. Uh, it's called the Gaia Theory, the Greek Earth Goddess, a fanciful name for a serious idea. And I just enjoy that because my Wi-Fi network is actually called Gaia. And London has um, brought in a, what's it called, uh, alternate weak system for vehicles. And he says, no doubt by now the city would have developed into one huge car park where nothing on four wheels could move more than two miles per hour. And I think that's kind of happened. I heard somewhere, and I don't know if it's true, that the average vehicle speed in London has been the same for like 200 years. So the development from horse and cart to motor car basically made no difference because of the amount of congestion. And then just another little bit of gore here that I wanted to share with you. Very final destination this. A man and a woman, the same two he had noticed earlier, came stumbling towards his car. The man, dressed in a beige, lightweight summer suit, shouted something at him, perhaps an appeal to open one of the passenger doors. For a second or two, Rivers was motionless, too overwhelmed by what was happening and its implications to move. But the terror on the couple's faces galvanised him into action and he reached over his seat to pull at the door handle. His fingers froze on the latch as a huge sheet of plate glass, dislodged from an office tower's upper windows, smashed onto the pavement outside. But before it had shattered into a million fragments, the toughened glass had sliced into the running man's left shoulder and scythed through the length of his body. Bizarrely, the woman held onto her companion as the rest of his body toppled away, and she looked into the eyes that still flickered with astonished life. The remaining portion of human flesh soon crumpled, leaving the woman clawing at her own face in shocked disbelief. So this is because a big earthquake hits. Um, very specific part of London, the, the square mile I think it's called. So another fantastic gory death here. Strong as it was, the steel hull of the dolphin cracked, the glass of the observation window burst, and the two men inside imploded. Didn't they Biggie? They imploded, they went <laughs> And a great line here. God help us, she said softly, and Rivers wondered if he would bother. And uh, we get a line here, this is about um, the main character. He lost his uh, partner to like the resurgence of a tropical disease and we get add to that the grief he must have suffered over the lover he had lost through an illness that had at one time been considered to have virtually died out but which had risen again like other such tropical diseases to epidemic proportions because of the radical change in the planet's environment it was ironic that this bygone disease should return so lethally while cures or near cures had been found for relatively new ones like AIDS and cancer. So that's one of his predictions that hasn't quite panned out, you know. And uh, here we get some scenes where we kind of learn about uh, various natural disasters happening around the world. So this is Pistigo, Wisconsin, uh, where peachy fishy books are from, even though they don't upload anymore and it's a shame because I miss them. But um, those are the people I know from Wisconsin. <laughs> Nobody could remember a longer drought in the history of America's Midwest and for months small and at least containable fires had plagued the pine forests along Green Bay near the borders of Wisconsin and Michigan. But on this day, when star-like lights had appeared over the treetops, high winds had united the scattered blazes into one huge conflagration that advanced on the lumber town of Pistigo as a massive wall of searing heat. As the townsfolk fled, their houses crumpled like paper and rooftops flew into the air to become fireballs themselves. Many of the people tried to escape in cars and trucks, but the fierce heat melted tyres and cracked windscreens. Others took to the Pistigo River, submerging themselves but perishing the moment they surfaced and inhaled air that had itself become incendiary. The driven fire created an enormous updraft and hurricane force winds whirled through the region, destroying everything in their paths. Onwards they sped, vortexes of wind and fire, hungry for nourishment, bent on total destruction. Above it all, a vast cloud of smoke darkened the morning sun, changing its brightness to a dark red hue, the colour of running blood. I just think it's horrifying, that thought of inhaling the air that just burns right through you. And then we have uh, Topeka, Kansas. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Sorry, Americans. Um, but I wanted to share this because I've recently been um, buddy reading The Wizard of Oz with Joel Swagman. And um, there are Wizard of Oz parallels here. I don't know if this is deliberate or not. This, this would be a very different Wizard of Oz, though. The tornado hit the capital city of Kansas in the early hours of the morning, just as the state assembly was gathering for its emergency debate on the UFOs that had been clearly sighted here, there and everywhere over the territory for two consecutive nights. The building was hurriedly evacuated as the storms tore in, and the Kansas National Guard stood by on full alert, not to help the worthy citizens, but to prevent looting from the damaged stores and private dwellings once the worst had passed. It was not a single tornado that swept through the Midwest, but a series of them, all wreaking their own separate havoc and demolition one flattening a whole caravan park, another destroying the hospital wing of a military base, all of them carrying people, lampposts, hoardings, cars, anything caught out in the open, hundreds of feet into the air, wrecking the less sturdy buildings, sweeping away livestock and turning rivers, some of which had almost run dry, into raging torrents. 
As well as Kansas, the winds and rain roared through Oklahoma, Nebraska and Louisiana, deadly swathes of destruction that for the time being obliterated all thoughts of weird flying lights and strange encounters. So yeah, that's about all I have that I wanted to share with you from Portent by James Herbert. I will say towards the end it started to flag a little bit and kind of lost me. Um, I mean, you could still follow along with the plot and stuff, but it just wasn't quite as gripping, I guess. It's almost as though it was more gripping when you didn't really know what was going to happen and what was going on. And then once you start to get your explanations, I don't know, it would just kind of have held my attention a little bit less, I guess. But I did still enjoy Port, and I would give it a weak four out of five, but still very much enjoyed. And I look forward to reading more James Herbert soon. So there we have it, that's what I made important by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.